Thank you very, very much. Let me start my timer because that's quite important if I really want to, to be able to keep everything on track. So I'm Diana Andone, he's my colleague Andrei. Uh, we are coming from Romania, from Timisoara. Our university is uh, brick and mortar. We are a very traditional university, established in fact since Romania was born as a country. And uh, we have, how to say, a lot of professors which, who still believes that the education should be traditional, that the higher education and the professors are in the ivory tower and everybody's allowed only through a tiny gate. In the last uh, almost 25 years, the e-learning center, which I'm leading, has tried to change that fact and has tried to show a different perspective to how education and higher education can be done. And uh, back in 2010, so about 12 years ago, we came up with this UPT, which is our University Digital Education Strategy, which luckily enough was approved by the Senate because this is how things work in universities and we were able to, to work with it and apply it. We first started with digitization and I'll say something very briefly about that. Why I'm putting this, just to create the context on how important the individuals which are doing things are, exactly what Andrea was mentioning uh, this morning. So we started with digitization, obviously, we wanted to build up a virtual campus, and uh, um, obviously that was based in Moodle, and then uh, the Unicampus and a lot of training and support. And I think that's the thing which we do quite well, probably, training and support, because a lot of other universities around Romania have come to us to give them the training and the support and also the information and the knowledge transfer to them. The virtual campus is based on Moodle. Our current version is 3.11.10. We have a lot of plugins, which also makes the life a bit more difficult for Andre. He's our headmaster on virtual campus when we are uh, uh, trying to make updates and so on. This is why we are still not on Moodle 4, because it was too little time to be able to do all of those updates, and especially that. We rely a lot on the mobile app, which is quite important for us. These are just some numbers. Uh, we do statistics, we are engineers, we love numbers. So that's why we keep showing them all the time. And uh, I just want to point out that more than 100,000 of resources and activities have been created in the virtual campus only in one year by our professors. Then we moved uh, back in 2014, I think, to a second stage, which is still continuing. So we, this is all under development constantly and continuously, but this is part of a strategy and a vision, which is called digitalization on that, where we were focusing on the enablers of the digital education and not only on the early adopters. And here we really wanted to create co-creation. One of the strengths of our university, and one thing which I strongly advocate for everybody, is involving students in co-creating, either open educational resources or any other resources, anything which you can do and then reuse either in education or for the larger community of the region. And we focus quite a lot on virtual mobilities since then. Uh, just in the moment when the pandemic started, we looked at digital transformation and this we wanted to do it because we really wanted to have this academic culture change, which is very important, at least in higher education. And I'm pretty sure all of you are aware of that. If you don't do that shift from instructional design to pedagogy, but also to policies and to administrative things, all the technological inputs which you will put, and it doesn't matter how much support and training you will give, it will not happen. So we focused for about eight, nine years on that, and we were able to say back in 2020, okay, we can see quite a lot of changes, which was lucky because the pandemic started and we were able to run and to smoothly, in one day, in fact, to move from traditional education in campus to fully online education because all of our students were already in the virtual campus. The professors had the material there, only the synchronous meetings were needed to be planned properly. What I would like to focus a tiny bit more uh, is about micro-credentials and how you build up that community collaboration, which is very important for digital transformation. Back in 2014, we initiated uh, uh, um, Unicampus, which is a MOOC platform dedicated to Romania. 
which is run now by us, but provides courses from uh, six other universities and a lot of courses which were developed in international partnership. But you cannot do that academic culture change without partnership and without this community of collaborators. And we were very happy to, to have Moodle among those, along with a lot of other very powerful international and European associations. So why micro-credentials? Why back in 2014, we focus a lot on open badges and micro-credentials? And the reason is quite well known. These are the data coming from United States, pre-pandemic 2019, done by Holon IQ. I just want to push it to you because I know quite a lot of you come also from companies. The numbers are staggering and they need to take, be taken into consideration. And as you see here, Quite a lot of that is not done by the higher education. The higher education was missing a tiny bit on that start. And here is a structure which Holland IQ proposes for how to build up the micro-credentials. And just the last three are those where the higher education had a strong input in the last years, and obviously with the MOOCs and everything which was happening worldwide. Something what we have done from the vision and also why the policies and the structure, like Andrea mentioned today, are so important, at least in Europe, and some evidence and effects of that. Uh, back, I think, in 2015, European Union has put up together a task force, a group of people which we and, uh, had this idea of Erasmus projects and so on, on open badges. So they said, OK, let's test it, let's do it, and then let's do some research based on that, and let's work it further. That came, became reality in December 2020, when uh, micro-credentials and the European approach to micro-credentials became a hot topic for the European section of the Commission. And then just later, one year, they had the launch event of the digital credentials and of everything what uh, the research and the policies and the experts have been doing and putting together. Then, June 2022 came, when a European uh, Union Council has approved a recommendation. For those who are not so much in European Union things, this is very important because a recommendation of the EU Council, which is the head of the prime ministers and the presidents of the country, becomes almost as a law in Europe. So every country will need to adopt it. And I need to say, I think 26 countries have really adopted it in only three months and apply it in their country. Why this is important? Because without that, usually you cannot really do something, at least not in the public education sector, because you don't have the law and the framework for doing it. Obviously, the companies can do it, but not the public sector. So that's why policies developed by the European Union, which are based usually in the research and the task force, which lead that, the individuals which started, are very important in Europe. I will try to drag attention to the changes here. And I got uh, quite a lot of questions just last week when at, at a strategy forum on edu education in Austria, I presented a similar topic. They said, what's the difference be between micro-credentials and short training programs, which we had probably since apprenticeship in new age and so on, new age and so on, so in the Illuminis, is the last two bits, the portability and the stackability the ability to create your competencies and to build up modularly, which again, it's becoming quite important and quite hot in Europe and in education. These are the standard elements and we will come to that to the end with the relation with Moodle and asking all of you to uh, think about that at the end. So I will bring that back to the end. I need to say that uh, the European Union has put in this recommendation the interoperability, which is a key factor on anything which now happens in micro-credentials and quite soon you will see also in uh, certified diplomas and in diplomas worldwide. So that's based on the, on the World Wide Web Foundation um, data, which is the ELMO, and it's the ADCI, it's quite verifiable data, so that gives the door open technically to be able to do whatever you want with that after that. Something about how we see those. We see them only informally at the beginning. So this is what we started doing. 
we start doing this with workshops. We run very popular workshops. <laughs> Andrea was at one of us, <laughs> I think some six years ago, or something like that. So we run it for 10 years now. One in March, which is dedicated to open education. One in November, December, which is dedicated, dedicated to digital competencies and skills. And recently, one in June, just because we had so much requests dedicated to digital transformation, where we look at the society in general, also the region, culture, and a lot of other things uh, where digital plays a role. So we started with those, and this introduced open badges in Romania, and they became very, very popular. A lot of people in education sector wanted to have them. Then in the pandemic, we had these together online webinars, which were very successful. Our average attendance rate was about seven, 800 educators every day, every week, sorry. So every week we were meeting them online and doing this. This was beside the training and the seminars which we were giving. So more than 10,000 open badges became a fact, which allowed educators, or especially from uh, pre-university education to climb the ladder professionally, basing on the knowledge which they had. They become recognized even before the EU gave us somehow the permission. This is how they looked. This year, we had the Shaping Together webinars, another almost 5,000 uh, badges which were released. We use them for a lot of other activities, as you see, uh, and the one which became very sought after is the contributor one which we built up in the pandemic to encourage professors from high schools and gymnasium, which were really contributor with open educational resources and putting it out and helping the others. And it became one of the most sought after batch, <laughs> at least in the Romanian education system. Very shortly about short courses. So we built these short courses based obviously in the experience which the MOOCs with the micro specializations and micro masters have showed to us, which are modular, and the validation we done is through industry and association. We haven't been looking at other quality assurance agencies. We just done the validations through associations. And here, uh, Moodle and a lot of other associations play a role. An example is the open virtual mobility, um, the badges which were dedicated to virtual mobility. And the other example is about the badges dedicated to enhancing digital competencies for the creative sector. And Andre will say something about the technical development, not to bore you with stuff like that. So I will switch the focus a bit to the implementation stage uh, of uh, these types of uh, micro-credentials. Uh, the first one is the, uh, our first foray into micro-credentials uh, was the Open Virtual Mobility Project, which began in 2017. Uh, Moodle was at the beginning of implemented uh, badges in their core uh, uh, code, so we uh, chose to uh, use a provider for badges from one of our partners from Italy. So in order to implement or integrate the badge emission, uh, emission mechanism, we developed uh, an API which uh, sent, well actually we used an existing API, XAPI plugin to send learning record stores uh, by which the Bester uh, mechanism issued the badges and they were brought back into the Moodle-based open uh, virtual mobility learning hub. There were three tiers of uh, badges, uh, which corresponding to the completion of a course. Um, the general um, schematic you, you can find in the, in the image to the right. This is an example of uh, showing the badge which uh, a user has already acquired or uh, which they can acquire if uh, they uh, finalize, complete the, all of the course's uh, uh, mandatory activities. This is an example of the badges. We had seven different uh, skills, which were um, then uh, tiered by three levels, uh, basic level, intermediate, and advanced level, and each uh, was corresponding to the completion of a course in the Moodle-based uh, OpenVM Learning Hub. Uh, then we switched to another project, which was Digital Culture. Here we had 13 different courses in seven languages corresponding to the languages of the partners. Uh, each of these courses had their own corresponding badge, but this, this was uh, already 2019 and we switched to the uh, internal Moodle uh, mechanism to uh, award badges. Uh, the badges were defined by uh, the skills they um, um, represent and uh, each of the users that acquired them could then 
uh, use them outside of the platform, but uh, the Unicampus platform, which actually hosts the digital culture uh, courses, is the issuer of these badges, uh, which were first uh, defined here. Um, but then they were uh, integrated with Badger, which is the newest um, uh, backpack integrated with Moodle uh, following Mozilla Badges' um, fall from grace, so to speak. Um, this is the, an example of uh, one of the badges that was developed, was uh, defined, and then, of course, awarded to all of the users who, who completed the courses. Um, as I said, uh, we prepared a lot of uh, tutorials in order to allow uh, the course uh, participants or the graduates uh, to use these badges in their social media profiles, uh, which, of course, uh, didn't um, develop any new mechanisms or anything like that. But uh, these uh, tutorials, these um, guidelines were very important because the target group for this project were people with low digital skills, uh, mainly from the digital uh, side of the, um, of the, the sorry, for the, from the cultural side of, uh, of society. Um, however, aside from the badges, which, uh, as I said, uh, are already core of Moodle, we also implemented certificates because we had a lot of requests from people who wanted to use a more traditional approach to recognition. Uh, badges are mainly aimed at uh, showing them in the social media page profile or of every user. However, certificates can be saved as PDFs, even printed. If uh, Diana mentioned earlier, uh, somebody needs to prove that they uh, acquired some, some skills or some badge. So we implemented the um, uh, certificate mechanism, which is uh, by default available in Moodle Workplace, but it, it is available in Moodle LMS as an installable add-on. So we developed uh, all of these uh, certificates of completion. Uh, as I said, they needed to uh, be in all of the partner languages. You have there an example of a diploma in, in German. Uh, this is an example how uh, the interface for creating a badge uh, is shown in, uh, in a Moodle for those of you who haven't um, experienced this, and also the large number of criteria that needs to be met by somebody who wants to, to receive this certificate. Um, I will mention very briefly here the virtual campus of the Polytechnic University of Timisoara, uh, which is our main e-learning platform. This is a closed platform. Uh, so as Diana also previously mentioned, uh, it's a very rigid uh, structure because it's the official uh, learning um, process uh, by the ministry, which, which is um, accredited. So micro-credentials, unfortunately, do not carry that much weight. However, because of the Badger integration, we also prepared um, tutorials allowing our students and professors to display in their profiles in the virtual campus the badges that they received elsewhere. We also had a limited program to award um, uh, the professors which were more uh, active in the, in the community uh, but these, as, as I said, are not officially recognized. They are only uh, uh, just uh, there for show, so to speak. Um, the, the badges that Diana mentioned for the webinars we uh, presented during the pandemic were not actually issued using Moodle. However, uh, we uh, used Badger directly because a lot of the participants to these uh, webinars were not uh, users on the virtual campus platform. Actually, one of the most um, uh, representative demographic were pre-university teachers, because as Diana said, there is a requirement for self-improvement in the academic uh, or ped pedagogical areas. So each of the um, professors need to prove that they did something to improve their, capability, their uh, skills. Um, the micro-credentials, micro which are also mentioned in today's um, keynote speech are very important. One of the projects where we are participating is the EBSI um, infrastructure, the European Blockchain Services Infrastructure, which aims to implement blockchain as a kind of medium uh, in order to uh, facilitate this recognition of, uh, across borders in Europe, using blockchain as an immutable way to um, store and present and uh, use all of these uh, recognition uh, criteria. Uh, at the beginning of the, uh, this year's summer, we finished the piloting phase of this project, where uh, three partners from three different countries were um, uh, created and implemented a scenario where a fictitious student 
um, which uh, graduated from one university from one country, was able to gain a diploma which was recognized through blockchain in another uh, country where uh, they finished a master study and then they went to a third country to uh, begin their PhD studies. All of these credentials were stored using blockchain and uh, were very easy to uh, use, to validate and to be recognized. This project is currently ongoing. It's switch it started switching from uh, testing to towards production or maybe pre-production. So uh, maybe this is something which you could um, uh, maybe follow. Uh, why do we mention this? Because uh, integrating this uh, mechanism, this uh, blockchain use through EBSI or another uh, similar um, infrastructure, it's something which could be um, maybe desirable to use in Moodle. There is not, uh, to our knowledge, uh, such a mechanism yet uh, available. However, we have colleagues, uh, I have a, a colleague who during uh, his PhD studies, um, focused on uh, blockchain technology and uh, hopefully we will be able to continue work and integrate a mechanism to uh, maybe integrate all of the badges or certificates that M Moodle issues using uh, such, a, such a blockchain connection with all of the advantages that this incurs. Uh, this is a more um, detailed view of the partners and the transnational uh, aspect of this, of this project. Um, yeah, so I, I went a little bit further with, with my speech. So I will let Diana finish. Yes, uh, so why this EPSI is so important? Because it proves, it really proves among 40 big, large, and traditional universities in Europe that the, a diploma, an engineer, a doctor, a diploma, can be transferable, recognized by other universities at this moment, not by the companies, but it Hopefully, that will be implemented because of the council approval, approval of that and the legislation which is changing in the countries to be able uh, to prove that they have done this degree with the competencies, with the courses, with the marks, with everything. And that be belongs to the student. It's in his wallet, so he can carry it out everywhere. It's becoming very personal. It's not based on a system which sometimes fails or it has difficulties to prove if a diploma exists or not. So that's why we wanted to do it. And Moodle should play a role on this. Not yet, but hopefully we'll be able. Andrea also mentioned European universities. Why we are focusing so much on micro-credentials? Our university is part of UDRES. UDRES is one of the 28 European universities alliances, which have become very powerful for the higher education building up the multi-university campus. And all of these partners, now we are implementing and validating micro-credentials and also blockchain diplomas between us. So that's why those are important and why we test it, we're piloting, and from this year, we really start doing it at a larger scale. Something to think about, as I mentioned, those who are in the left, the European Digital Credentials for Learning, as they are put in the European Council Union, um, let's make it like that, stack. So all of those need to be met by any tool, anything which is developed <laughs> and which looks at the micro-credentials. And in the, in the right, yes, that's right also for you, we put what the Moodle certificate and badge is doing and where is missing. So you can see that quite a lot of uh, those are fixable and done. For example, one of the things which uh, we will like for Moodle to be able to do is to have full main and email address separately and the email address hidden only to be shown in the wallet of the participant. That's something in which we are working. And obviously the wordy body, date of issuing, all of those are existing. The other bit which is not very clear and the European Union Council asked to be quite clear is the workload. You can only put it as a text, not as a number. Those numbers will become important for the stackability of the micro-credentials, so they will need to be separate as a field quite soon. And then the others, the level and the cycle of education. Again, only as text. You cannot select it or you cannot input it as a separate thing. The type of assessment is missing completely. You can put it again only in the text. 
the form of participation, online and blended, that's what you put, but also again as a text is not a clear field separate in the Moodle certificate. And then obviously the type of the quality assurance, which is very important. Uh, nowadays that's imported for the awarding body, like a university and their associations which are uh, supporting that. Sorry, so my time is up. I'll finish it, it's the last side. This is why this is good, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and that's uh, really something which we need to do. So as told you, it's the last slide. So uh, this is us and the team behind us, which is working quite strongly on that. Thank you very much. So questions, I'll ask that directly. Thank, thank you very much. My name is Jim Judges from Warwick University in England. Oh, uh, thank you for a really detailed insight into your work. Very exciting. Uh, can you say something about this common problem uh, with the ivory tower and the small door and what impact uh, has your work had on the size of that door? Um, I strongly believe personally, but also in part of our group on, uh, on the early adopters and on the improvement uh, testing, you know? So proof of concept, bring it to pilot, and then bring it to large scale. It's grassroots movement, which will always work. It's my experience. Uh, I've been doing this since 95, more or less. So I can, I can, this is it. How it happens, you need a bit of luck also. I will say that. And the luck usually comes if you are in a community. This is, in my experience, at least how it comes. So you built up either associations or you join existing association, you change the structure of some association. Like for example, IEEE, I don't know how many of you know about IEEE. This is huge, this is American base. They are very much focused on money on engineering. We managed to change in the IEEE education, uh, the idea of IEEE, how they work the certificates. And for example, with this topic, and that they looked more on open access and open education and micro certificates, which were about 10 years ago, they were so strongly against this. And now it's changed, it's become part of their core policy. And when an association, so a community do, does this, every individual which is part of that community or that association will do something, will hear something, and then the change is happening. So that's happening, at least in our experience. How we change that at university level, beside of the strategy policies and so on, support and training. You never fail if you do that <laughs> properly, obviously. <laughs> Thank you. Hi. Could you talk a little bit more about how you've ensured uh, equivalencies across badges and how you've determined what levels e each badge equates to? Um, the um, definition of the badges was uh, individually uh, set for each of the courses. So the course creators, the uh, learning design instructors who created all of the activities and all the resources which were available, made sure that uh, the assessment methods and uh, the skills that they were um, proving by issuing these badges were, um, were the same. So it's not more a, a technical issue, but a policy issue. Does this answer your question? Good morning. Hi. My name is Matabo Nageni. I'm from University of South Africa. We also starting to work on a blockchain for our credentials. What can you share as the biggest lesson that you, you can share for us as we st get started on this journey? Um, well, actually. <laughs> Yeah, so I was uh, just trying to put him to say, so uh, everything which is developed in FCI, so the, in the European blockchain system infrastructure, is becoming open access. One of the main requirements of everything which is funded by European Union is open access. So uh, that, that the code and almost everything it's there is available. As I said, it was piloted already this summer and uh, it worked, so we'll see. But several wallets have been developed and so on, so you can look at that. Have a look at the FCI website. I think we have it somewhere here. Um, where it is. Yep, this is one, for example, and then this is the other one. So if you look at those, if you just say FCI blockchain Europe, you will find it. 
It's, it's one website which is showing this now. So that's in the first page. Don't go to other pages, which are the successful first pilots. If I can complete the answer. So our, our biggest take from uh, our initial foray into blockchain is that it's not a, a technical problem. So because there are, there are a lot of tutorials and technical people who know how to implement, how to create a node and connect it and issue all of the, this blockchain. The biggest issue is to make these uh, scenarios, to use them, and especially convince the authorities or the people who um, are in position to accept them, to recognize that the diplomas which are stored there are valid and they do represent, uh, reflect some skills or uh, abilities for the, for the wearer.